Hi, everybody. How was everyone tonight? I want to thank you all for coming out. Here we are again in our AI lecture series. I think this is actually our seventh. And um, we have some uh, interesting stuff here, here for you tonight. I hope you enjoyed some pizza. And I hope you had a chance to put your business card in the, in the fish bowl there. If not, write your name up there, because we're having a raffle. Um, we're raffling off some Jamba Juice cards and some um, Starbucks. There we go. And uh, first up here, we're going to um, have the people who are actually uh, sponsoring that. That's Trinet. And we're also having Gregory Manley up here for, uh, who's doing business development. I'm going to let them speak. They're going to speak for just a few minutes here, kind of introduce you to who they are and uh, get things kicked off here. So uh, let's go ahead and have, you want to come up here, Gregory? Fantastic. This is uh, Gregory Manley, and he does uh, business development manager. I'll let you go. Hey, guys. How are you guys doing? Um, so I'm Gregory Manley, as he had previously mentioned. We're part of Early Growth Financial Services. Uh, so we work closely with Trident, but also a bunch of incubators, accelerators, and co-working spots like this um, all across the Bay Area as well as the country. Um, so we do outsource CFO and accounting work. Um, so we help early growth stage companies get gap compliant, um, as well as uh, help them strategically raise funds, um, as well as manage those funds once those do come through. Um, so I'll be happy to talk to any of you guys who have any financial questions or you know any possible need um, down the line. Feel free to reach out to me after this is over. Thank you. What's your name again? Yes, Greg Manley. Thank you. So if you're a startup or you're looking that way, Greg would be someone you'd want to talk to. And if you were into um, or if you wanted to have some insight on, on your human resources, we have Od Odette up here from Trinet. All right. Thanks so much, and good evening to all of you. Thank you for coming here. I do appreciate your time. And um, if you have a business card with you, we are raffling off the Jamba Juice and Starbucks gift card, so feel free to drop your business card on the fishbowl. So a little bit about Trinet. What we do is that we help startups like yourselves get up and running um, by providing a full HR solution. So some of the companies that we've worked with are Ring, when there were like six employees, WhatsApp, Living Social, Netflix. So these are just some of the names that we've worked with. Uh, last year alone, we've worked with about 27 unicorns. So we want to do the same for you, support you, so you can be that next unicorn. So I do have a card on that table and a little uh, flyer if you guys want to um, take a look at Trinet. Thank you. OK, uh, now before we get to our main speaker, um, who is Ashilpa Kohatkar from uh, NVIDIA. We are going to ha have uh, someone here who's a local, one of our um, people who hang out here at, at Hacker Dojo. And uh, his name is Tr uh, Turan Malik. And Turan uh, has a startup idea that, or actually a business idea here called RepMonk AI. It is machine learning. And we're going to let Tarun, come up here and tell us a little bit. This will be about 10 minutes or so before we get the main speaker. Hey, thanks. Uh, and it's going to be approximately an hour. So, Shilpa, just saying. <laughs> so, yeah, guys, uh, I'm going to pull up the slides. Are the slides on? Yeah, no, that's, let's see what we got here. There we go. Okay. Uh, so, hey, guys, my name again is Tarun Malik, and I'm the founder of RepMonk AI, and we are uh, building technology to power the next-gen uh, fitness experience. So, what we are, uh, so we all know that all of us should work out, and the good news is that a lot of Americans are paying for that experience, but they're not really working out. So, 55 million Americans pay average of $50 a month to, in gym memberships. And, uh, you know, people are realizing that they aren't really going to gyms. And so this has led to a big revolution in this home startup industry uh, where, you know, companies like Peloton, Tonal, uh, they are making these home startup experience, home uh, workout experience very engaging, you know, social. Uh, you have all the data and that data plugs into this uh, social channel. Uh, there are live classes and all this stuff. Uh, but they use all this proprietary hardware and expensive uh, stuff which I can't afford. So we, were, we started thinking around, hey, how can we build this experience using, for example, smartphones or smartwatches? And so this is what we do. Uh, we build, uh, we are powering the next generation fitness experience, making it completely seamless and invisible to the user. 
uh, having goal-based metrics, uh, and making it very much personalized in both quantitative and qualitative sense. And I'll show a couple of examples here. So one is, you know, uh, we built this uh, workout analytics using a smartphone camera, uh, and I'll show you an example. So this is me just last week working out. You know, I've lost a little bit of weight, but you can see. Uh, uh, so, you know, out here you can not only uh, see the number of reps, but you can also see the rep, uh, the rep speed and the rep times. And rep times actually give you a qualitative idea of what the workout is like. Uh, if they're very consistent, you know, the user kind of finds it easy to do the workout. And if they are not very consistent, you know, you can approximate as that the user is, uh, you know, uh, struggling with the workout. Uh, and this is all done using a, you know, using a video and similarly this. So it's independent of the type of background person or the type of exercise. We don't even need to know what type of exercise it is. Uh, so that's one. And you'll see that, you know, there are some inconsistencies in the workout, like, you know, her hand will go down and we still can figure out uh, what kind of workout is happening, say approximately, now, there you go. So uh, stuff like that. And the other other thing is, you know, using a smartwatch. Uh, so uh, Apple Watch, Fitbit, you know, they currently classify workouts as workouts, uh, and we are trying to make this much more granular. And so this is a completely seamless experience. You know, user doesn't need to touch the touch your phone, watch, or uh, uh, you know anything else. So the, the rep count starts at three, it recognizes the exercise, it recognizes the reps, the rep times, start stops automatically, uh, you know, recognizes almost uh, 40 workouts right now. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, there's a longer version of the video I can show later, uh, but yeah, that, it goes on. Uh, so who are we? You know, I have a PhD in, from University of Illinois. Uh, I used to work at Intel. I'm a machine learning and fitness enthusiast. My co-founder, she's a fastest Indian swimmer, and uh, you know, she gives me all the ideas, and probably I just, you know, try to implement them. So, uh, so that's that's who we are. Uh, we are building these uh, SDK for fitness app and de device developers to automatically get this data and plug into their fitness apps. Uh, so thank you, and open to any questions. Oh, right, right. Like a laptop camera that, that's correct. And then the second one, or the second one I saw, was <coughs> uh, uh, and that had nothing to do with video. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. When is the SDK? When? Uh, you know, I'll have to ask my co-founder. But yeah, soon, hopefully soon. We are targeting like, uh, you know, a month, uh, <laughs> six to eight weeks. Uh, so right now, you know, we are focused on home-based workouts. Uh, uh, you know, we haven't really experimented a lot outdoors, but, you know, I don't see a reason why, you know, some of this stuff won't work outdoors. Why do you name the Monk? What is that? Why do you name the company Monk? You know, I used to work for a previous company with the name Monk. So I was trying to come up with the names, and there is a guy out here, he voted this name first. He's like a fitness buff, so I was like, okay. But overall, the idea is that, you know, Monk is like a wise person. So, like, recommendations for reps from a wise person. That's the overall theme here. All right, I'll be around, you know, if, if you have any other questions. So, uh, thank you again. All right. That was Turan Malik, and the company was monk.ai. And the, ne the next up is going to be uh, V.S. Joshi. V.S. is the one who kind of organized all the different speakers here. And we're going to let, uh, we're going to have V.S. Uh, speak a little bit. And then after V.S., we're going to uh, introduce our main speaker. Hey, everybody. Hello. My name is V.S. V.S. Joshi. I am a Hacker Dojo member, and I'm also one of the organizers for this event series. How many people are brand new to Hacker Dojo? This is the first time for them in Hacker Dojo over here. Okay, okay, so we do have at least uh, 10 to 12 people over here who are brand new. So uh, just again, uh, Hacker Dojo has been in existence since 2009. This is one of our mottos, okay? Inspiring innovation and creativity through technology, discipline, and community. 
And uh, many people ask, what exactly is Hacker Dojo? And you'll get different kind of answers. And it's all of this. It is a co-working space. Uh, by that, what we mean is we have all about 300 members or so. And um, uh, these members are essentially entrepreneurs, wannabe entrepreneurs, people who are working full day somewhere else. And then at night, they come over here instead of sitting in a coffee shop. They come over here with their co-founder and they try to hack new ideas and try to build the new companies, new startups and things like that. So we have many people like that. Uh, during the daytime, we will have people who are, again, uh, who are small, small teams of two people, five people. Usually what happens is when the, when the startup becomes like seven to eight people or so, they graduate out of uh, Hacker Dojo and they get their own space. But until they are about seven, eight people, they will be over here and they will be kind of uh, working. Um, and again, the Hacker Dojo is open 24 by seven. There are many people who are here who work, uh, uh, who use Hacker Dojo as their remote office. Their headquarters is somewhere in New York and LA and wherever it is, but they use this as a, again, we have almost like 300 members. We have had uh, almost like 2,500 startups that have, uh, that have been at Hacker Dojo. I had my own startup, it was also at Hacker Dojo. Some of the well known startups that have graduated from Hacker Dojo are Pinterest and Pebble, right? Yeah, Pinterest and Pebble, both these startups started over here and then after some time they graduated from here. Uh, again, it is also a maker space uh, and uh, if you just check over there, there are 3D, uh, 3D printers over there, there's a soldering gun over there, there's also a laser cutting machine inside over here. So it is also a maker space. It is uh, also an event space. There are like 5,000 events, we have conducted 5,000 events uh, over here at Hacker Dojo. So right now, um, again, like at any given evening, we will have some of the other event going on. It is like we'll have hackathons going on. We will have a code camp going on. There are in summer, there are a lot of kids who come over here for kids technical camp and things like that. So all these things happen over here. And uh, again, uh, it's also our executive director, Ed, he's trying to make this as a learning space. It has been a learning space, but he's trying to put more focus onto it being a learning space. This whole series, AI lecture series, is essentially uh, Hacker Dojo coming up with some, uh, working on the latest technologies and coming up with a lecture series where people can come over here and learn about that particular thing. Right now we are having it AI lecture series. Starting in Jan, uh, last week of Jan, we are going to have a blockchain series and that is going to be like an eight to 10 week blockchain series, again for beginners. Again, it's going to be free of charge and things like that. So I think that is, that is the basic uh, uh, basic idea behind Hacker Dojo. It's uh, again, it's a learning space, event space, maker space, co-working space. Okay. Uh, today we are having Shilpa over here, and we are introduce Shilpa later over here. But uh, again, after this, we are also having uh, these three lectures: uh, uh, chatbots and virtual assistant. Uh, the person is from Accenture, and then we have robotics uh, and AI. Yeah, we are that is on a Halloween night. And I think, uh, Ed, we have something different planned for the Halloween night, right? Yeah. Okay, so something, yeah, so Ed, Ed will, uh, uh, Ed will uh, throw some color on what we have planned for Halloween night later, okay? And, uh, and on November 7, we have autonomous vehicles. And after this, there is one more lecture that is on November 14th, and it is about AI product management. So those, these are the four more lectures remaining. This is the seventh lecture, and as I keep on saying every time, each and every lecture is an independent lecture. If you have missed the earlier lecture, absolutely no problem. You can still come for any of these lectures, okay? Anyway, I think uh, today uh, our speaker, uh, she's going to talk about uh, deep learning and deep learning has just taken over the world in the last uh, five, six years or so. And uh, I'm just going to sh share some slides with you and essentially bringing you up from the beginning of uh, AI unto the deep learning, and then Shilpa will come over here and she will take over uh, thereafter, okay? So again, this uh, history of AI, AI, believe me, it's an absolutely fascinating history of AI. And again, I can tell you that this history is not that old in the sense that it started in 1950 or so. So there might be some people in the audience who were there when this whole AI thing was happening right next to them. So again, it's a very, uh, brand, I mean, the, the whole thing started in 1950. And again, it has gone through its ups and downs. And if you look at this chart over here, you will see that yes, 1950s and 60s, those were the golden years of AI. And then when in the 70s, it is called the AI winter, the first AI winter that happened in the 70s, 
80s, again, it was the rise of the expert systems, and because of the rise of the expert system, it saw a tremendous boom. 80s was, again, the late 90s was essentially the fall of the expert systems, and for the last 20 years, it has just gone uh, through because of things like neural network and deep learning and things like that. So again, it has seen it lot, lots of ups and downs, and, but again, it's uh, all started with uh, uh, this thing with uh, Alan Turing and uh, Alan Turing's Turing test. So this was a seminal paper written by Alan Turing, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. A seminal, this was by Alan Turing, this was written in 1950. And the whole paper started with this line. I propose to consider the question, can machines think? That was the question, that's how we started the whole. Uh, and this is considered as the seminal paper. This is considered as the first paper, you can say, as far as AI is concerned. But then what happened was, can machines think? But then how do you define thinking? That was a question. How do you define all this? How do you define machine? How do you define thinking? So Alan Turing kind of changed the question. And the question was, can machines behave like human beings? Because here's the thing, you know, like if in case I ask you, what is the capital of, let's say, Chile? or what is the capital of Germany? Some of you might get it wrong. And if you get it wrong, does that mean that you are not thinking beings? That's not the case, right? You are thinking beings. So the, when can machines think, it is not about whether the machines can give the right answer or not. Can machines behave like human beings so that they are indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the human beings? That was what he was trying to uh, answer. And again, this Turing test is essentially, think of it, these are three entities over here. Entity A, B, and C. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so entity A, B, and C. Entity C is a human being. Entity C is an interrogator. Entity C is a judge. Entity A and B, we don't know who entity A and B are. One of them is a machine and one of them is a human being. Okay. So try to put yourself into the situation of you are entity C for that matter. Okay. You are the interrogator, you are the judge. Whether which one is a human being and which one is a, uh, is a machine. Again, Turing test is not a test for the human being. It is, not for the, it is not a test for you, the judge. It is a test for the machine. Can the machine, th eh? so this is a test for the machine and what is happening over here is, there is a communication, there is an interaction happening between entity C and entity A and B, okay? And the exchange of that conversation that is happening between them, it is in form of text, it is in, uh, it is in, yeah, it is in the form of text, so that it's not that somebody is speaking from the other side, otherwise they'll be able to figure out which is the machine and which is the human being, right? So it just, it's a text conversation that is happening, and the machine on the entity C or the human being C is supposed to find out which is a machine and which is a human being. But here's the thing, both the entities, entity A and entity B, they're both acting as if they're human beings. Now, if, but one of them is clearly lying and the other person is, and the other entity is not, if the entity C can figure out in a five minute conversation, if the entity C can, can say, okay, if the entity C, entity C makes more than 30% mistakes, oh, this answer must be from a machine or this answer from a human being. If the entity C makes more than 30% of mistake, then the machine is said to be have passed the Turing test. Yes, because the person who was sitting on the other side, he could not distinguish between a machine and a human being, so this machine has passed the Turing test. And as of now, since 1950 it started with, as of now, as of now, nobody has passed the Turing test. There is a rumor that in 2014 there was some called Edgbaston or something like that. That particular thing did pass it, but there is a controversy around that particular thing. But again, nobody has kind of passed the Turing test as yet. So yeah, here's what I was saying. The C is supposed to figure out which is AI, which is the machine and which is the thing. Okay, so this, okay, this was, okay, anyway. So Alan Turing, as I mentioned, Alan Turing, he's an uh, he's, uh, English mathematician. He's uh, a computer scientist. He's a father of, considered as a father of theoretical computer science and, uh, and artificial intelligence. <laughs> but the biggest, I think, uh, the biggest contribution that Alan Turing did was during the World War II. And it is said that Thanks to his efforts, he was able to save 14 million people 
uh, Alan Turing. If in case you have, I don't know whether you have seen this movie, but if in case you get a chance, do see this movie, Imitation Games. Benedict Cumberbatch and Keira Knightley, both fantastic actors. And this movie about Alan Turing is about the time. It's not about the AI part of it. It is just before the AI part of it where he is essentially a crypto analyst. He's a mathematician. He is trying to decode the German Navy's uh, code, uh, the Enigma code. He's trying to decode, and he managed to decode it. And because he was able to decode it, the war was supposed to get, the war got over two years earlier. And it seems that one, one year equals to seven million people died or something like that. So that's why they say that, okay, because of Alan Turing, 14 million people were saved and because of his contribution to the World War II. And this came as a surprise to me that, yes, when people talk about who are the people responsible for ending the World War II, Winston Churchill and Alan Turing, those two names come, like, they come together, it seems. Yeah? And this is, again, I think I just wanted to show you this particular, I don't know whether this clip will work, but let's try it. Okay. No volume? I don't know. Okay, no problem, no, no problem, it's, it's uh... Okay. Oh, snapshot, good, I like it. Uh, no, 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 this is, it won't be right on the close, forget it. Okay. Yeah. It's okay, I think it's okay, it's, it is not, uh... No, no, it's okay, it's okay. Right. Forget, forget, forget. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. How do I go to presentation? <laughs> presentation. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. okay. Sorry, again, I think, please do see the movie, okay? <laughs> it's a small scene from the movie, and he's again essentially talking about the same Turing test, and there's a prisoner who's taking the, tu I mean, he's the one who's acting as a judge in that particular Turing test, okay? Now, here is one question I have asked at one of the other conferences I've been at, and um, I just want to try it. How many people know when were computers invented? When were computers invented? Okay, yeah? Charles Babbage had a mechanical error in 1842. Okay, Charles Babbage, okay. Who? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, uh, that's okay. Yeah. But again, I think computer invention, I think there are uh, too many inventors. Charles Babbage is definitely considered with that analytical engine and differential engine, he's definitely considered one of them. But then thereafter, there are like lots of other people who have kind of claimed that thing, I guess. Yeah, was 1939. That's right, that's right. So if in case somebody asks us to, okay, who is the inventor of computers, you get different kind of answers and you get different kind of dates. Here we were fortunate that we had a person who had the exact knowledge and exact date and time and things like that. He might even know the time. <laughs> but anyway, so I think uh, when it comes to AI, there is a specific date, which is the birth of AI. And that specific date, that specific time is the summer of 1956. In summer of 1956, this person called John McCarthy, he had... He proposed, he proposed a two-month, ten-people meeting at Dartmouth University. And for that, he put a proposal and he said, okay, people who are well-known people in the AI field, in the mathematics field, in the computer science, in the economics, he got all these ten people together and these ten people he got uh, together so that they will come over here and they will discuss AI and they will kind of... Uh, Enhance the, uh, enhance the field of AI and things like that. So that's the reason why he did this thing. They tried to get funding. They got funding from Rockefeller Foundation for $7,000 or so. And for two months in 1956 summer, these people came together. And yes, not that they came up with any algorithms or anything like that, but that meeting, that meeting kind of established the discipline of artificial intelligence. This was the first time the words artificial intelligence were spoken. These were the first time the word artificial intelligence was introduced. 
So for all practical purposes, yes, 1956 summer is considered as one of the, uh, that's the birth date of uh, AI. Yeah? And again, I think all these people, John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, they are essentially considered as the fathers of AI. They are the fa fa founding fathers of AI. Uh, John McCarthy, he invented Lisp, he, the invent, uh, Lisp language. And as you know, uh, Lisp might be the second, it's the second oldest programming language and it is still used today. And it is the programming language of choice for AI. So I just wanted to show you another thing. So these are the five best programming languages for AI. Python, R, Lisp, Prolog, and Java. I said this is the second oldest language. Can anybody tell which is the oldest uh, language, programming language? Sorry? Yeah, OK. Second? Second, yes, Lisp. Second is Lisp, yeah. Third? Sorry? Fourth? I think you got it, yes. <laughs> so again, so if in case there are any, if there is anybody over here who had studied Lisp, you are back in business, folks, because as you can see, <laughs> Lisp is the only common language between the oldest language and the language for AI. So you are really back in business, okay? So I think uh, be ready. <laughs> the second person is Marvin Minsky, 1961. He, now there are, again, I said it's a fascinating history only because there are people within this AI community, some of them started with a top-down approach, and some people started with a bottom-up approach. And in a top-down approach, it was about pre-programming a computer with the rules that govern the human behavior. And the, the bottom-up approach was about neural networks, it was about understanding the brain, understanding from the experiences and things like that. That was the bottom-up approach. But this was a, a top-down approach, and he favored the top-down approach. And he wrote a seminal paper on which called the steps towards artificial intelligence. I think the basic premise was anyone trying to mimic intelligence in the machine had to solve five distinct categories of problem, search, pattern recognition, learning, planning, and induction. And that's how, again, I think the one thing I would like you to uh, remember from here is that yes, this person had a top-down approach and it was all about pre-programming a computer. Now that is not what AI as we know as of now, but that was his vision pre-programming a computer. And yes, he, John McCarthy, and all these guys, they went on that particular track, okay? Again, these people are considered as the fathers of uh, AI, of founding fathers of AI, because again, after the 1956 uh, conference, Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy, they started the MIT AI lab. John McCarthy left MIT and went to Stanford and started the Stanford AI Research Lab. Uh, there were two other people, Herbert Simon and Annel, Alan uh, Newell. They started the Carnegie Mellon University uh, lab. And all these labs were essentially funded by DARPA. Yeah? Again, I think all these academic institutions, they are a big name in themselves. I don't know whether you saw this news that came just this week on Monday. MIT plans a college for artificial intelligence backed by $1 billion. MI, and this again, if you look at the news, it is October 15th. 2018, just two days back. This was news. MIT is, they're putting $1 billion towards creating a college for computer science and artificial intelligence. And believe me or not, they have already got $650 million. They've already got $650 million and the courses are starting in 2019. And again, this has become MIT and uh, Stanford, they have become the uh, research institutes for uh, essentially all uh, AI related stuff at this point in time. Again, so with all these things, so this was happening in the 1950s and 60s. Now you come to 1970s, and in 1970s, the first AI winter started in the sense that there was uh, the research institutes, they stopped, uh, there was a pessimism within the institutes, there was a pessimism as far as funding was concerned and things like that, and it all started because of this ALPAC report which was highlighted the failure of machine translation. It is basically Automated Language Processing Advisory Committee. ALPAC report in 1966, they highlighted the failures of machine translation, and this is what happened. You know, I mean, uh, you know, we were at that point in time, I think we were in the midst of the Cold War between uh, US and Russia, and US government was looking for people to translate from Russian to English and things like that. So they had, they were putting a lot of money into it, they were putting a lot of uh, energy into this uh, language, uh, um, language translation. But at the end of it, the results were very, very bad. Like this particular sentence, the spirit is willing, but the flesh, but the flesh is weak. 
When it went through translation, it came like this. The vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. <laughs> so as you can see, I mean, all the money that was put into the uh, whole, uh, this entire uh, AI effort was not getting the results that it was supposed to get. And because of that, okay, this, uh, this was one news. The other news was about, again, this is abandonment of study of perce uh, perceptrons. As I mentioned, Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy, they went ahead with the top-down approach. And then there were some people who went with the bottom-up approach. Perceptrons. Perceptrons was essentially a part of that bottom-up approach where it was all about, uh, it was all about the, the various layers and uh, uh, it was about the connectionism between one layer and the other layer. So this was what can be called as the thing that started before the neural networks, which was before the neural networks, uh, perceptrons. And this guy, Frank Rosenblatt, this person was Marvin Minsky's, he was Marvin Minsky's classmate in high school. He was Marvin Minsky's, but again, Marvin Minsky himself kind of completely criticized this entire perceptron. He wrote a book and he kind of highlighted as to how this is not a way to go. So again, the bottom-up approach, top-down approach, they had some kind of a internal uh, a debate going on over there. Other thing was in 1970s in the UK, this was happening in the US, but whereas in the UK there was this Lighthill report that was written by uh, James Lighthill, Sir James Lighthill, and he criticized the entire field of AI left, right and center. He, he scorched the whole uh, thing and again he mentioned that the, uh, he criticized the failure of AI to achieve its grandiose objectives. And I think one of the main reasons he mentioned was it is because of the problem of combinatorial explosion. What it means is once you start getting into the real world, there are so many options. The, the op number of options exponentially keep on changing. And because the number of options keep on exponentially changing, it's very difficult to pre-program it, difficult to program and things like that. And that was the challenge with this uh, particular way of going, the top-down approach. And so his take was AI is only good for solving toy versions of the problem. So with all these kind of news and things like that, DARPA pulled back the funding, uh, funding in UK was pulled back, and that's where that whole AI winter started. Then come to 1980s, in the 1980s, we had this rise of the expert system. And essentially expert systems are computer programs, they are aimed to model the human expertise in one, in, in a very specific knowledge area, in a specific domain. That is what expert systems are. And essentially, the usage of expert systems, they grew almost like 30% or so. Companies like Dell, Texas Instruments, IBM, Xerox, HP, they became the big names in this particular field. Again, uh, universities like MIT, Stanford, CMU, Rutgers, they were at the top, up there at the top of the game at this point in time. We had expert systems such as the XCON, Lisp machines, Symbolics. They became very popular as a specialized system. Again, it was about pre-programming the computer for a specific domain. And yes, because it was for a specific domain, there was, they were able to kind of get a handle over the number of, uh, uh, number of options and number of uh, uh, variations it can have. Yeah? It simulated the decision-making ability of human experts to solve the narrow specific problems such as diagnosing the diseases and identifying chemical compounds. So this was the rise of expert system. This was the, after the fall, it was the rise of expert systems. But by late 1990s, what happened was these desktop computers from IBM and Apple, they became started gaining the speed and power. And they overtook the expensive, uh, ex uh, expensive Lisp and the expensive uh, expert systems as such. And because of that, the entire hardware market, which was essentially the entire AI hardware market, which was essentially the expert system market, it collapsed. It collapsed. All of a sudden, from a $1 billion industry, it completely was wiped off within one year or so because all these desktop computers become extremely powerful. And that was the start of the AI winter too. Again, you, this is something that you must have all heard of, Deep Blue, essentially IBM's Deep Blue versus Gary Kasparov. And yes, Deep Blue, it won that uh, uh, chess game. Again, but the question was, is it really AI over here? Or is it just the matter of you have powerful computers? And yes, people who were, who were into this from a top-down approach, they said, okay, here you go. They, for them, this was a victory. For the people who were a top-down approach, because it was pre-programming and things like that, they had programmed the IBM Deep Blue in such a way that it will win the chess game as such. And 
they were restricted from doing it earlier because it didn't have the computing processing power. But with, in 1997, they had the computer processing power, and because of it, they won. And, uh, but again, people started wondering, hey, is it really AI, or is it just the brute force of, uh, uh, brute force of the computing power that is kind of in play over here? At the same time, this person, um, Rodney Brooks, he wrote a published, he published a paper, and this became a seminal paper, Elephants Don't Play Chess. And he completely went against, his, against the prevailing thought that, and he said, he completely argued that the top-down approach of pre-programming a computer with the rules of intelligence was completely wrong. And he, he drove the revival of the bottom-up approach to AI, including the field of neural networks. So there is where kind of you can say, uh, Rodney Brooks, he was started with this whole neural network. But in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the, uh, Marvin Minsky had tried to kill that whole perceptron thing. That was also a part of neural networks, you can say. So that thing, this particular thing, and that's where the whole neural network uh, movement started. And again, as you know, uh, November 2008, Google app launched, was, was launched on iPhone for a speech recognition. And as you can see, the, they took a completely different approach. Thousands of computers running parallel neural networks, learn, trying to learn to spot the patterns and things like that. And the word accuracy of that particular thing has kind of gone to 95% of the English language is similar to the human threshold. Okay. 2011, IBM Watson versus the Jeopardy champion. Here, what we have is IBM's Watson having a Jeopardy contest with the two champions of Jeopardy, uh, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutner. And here too, uh, IBM Watson won uh, tremendously, and again, this was much more. I mean, Watson had to answer riddles and complex questions. It used lots of AI techniques, including the neural networks and things like that. And the machines were trained for three plus years. But again, so there's neural network, and so it be started becoming a combination of many things. It is not only the neural network, but it is also the computer, uh, computer processing power coming into picture over here. Yeah? So as you can see, it is the computer processing power coming into picture, the neural networks coming into picture. And then we have this uh, ImageNet challenge over here. And this one can say, if the current AI boom, if the current AI boom can be pinpointed to a particular event, it would be this particular ImageNet challenge competition that happened in 2012. So basically, I don't know for people who don't know, who may not know about ImageNet, ImageNet is essentially a database of something like 14 million images. 14 million images that have been labeled. This is a dog, this is a cat, this is this kind of a dog, this is a golden retriever, this is a Frenchie, this is a poodle, whatever it is. 14 million images have been labeled. And this person, Fei Fei Li, she works for Google and she's a Stanford professor. She was the person behind this entire ImageNet database. She kind of went with it for almost like 10 years or so. And with tremendous difficulty, she created this whole database of 10 million, uh, 10, uh, sorry, 14 million images. And the competition is essentially about Researchers coming up with an algorithm, researchers coming up with an algorithm by which they will make image classification easier. Okay? So, and here in this competition in 2012, if you can see over here, uh, these, many, these many researchers competed, and you can see that the, in the competition first year, teams have varying success. Every team got at least 25% wrong. 25% mistakes were made over here in the first year. Second year, again 25%. And in the third year in 2012, when the results came out, people were extremely shocked. They were shocked because the results for the winning team were tremendous. And this winning team was a team that was of Jeffrey Hinton, Ilya, and Alex from the University of Toronto submitted a deep convolutional neural network architecture called AlexNet. And it beat the field by a margin of 10.8%. This was a huge, again, which is almost like 41% better than the next. So this happened in 2012. The moment it happened, all the researchers started thinking about, okay, how can they use uh, uh, CNN into their uh, algorithms and things like that. And then the following year, you will see almost each and every team got 25% or fewer uh, images wrong. And now we have come to a stage where this year, 2017, was the last year of ImageNet competition. And in the 2017 ImageNet competition, 29 of the 38 teams got less than 5% wrong. 
This improvement is much better than a human eye. A human being can make more mistakes than what a machine can make at this point in time as far as classifying a particular image is concerned. Okay? And this again, so this came all because of uh, deep learning. And uh, if you look at this particular graph, what it says is, yes, you have with the older learning algorithms, with the older learning algorithm, the performance goes up, up to a certain extent. Up to a certain extent. And after that extent, even if you put more and more data into it, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't improve the performance. It has to be deep learning that comes into picture that kind of completely improves the performance and it takes to a completely different level. So the performance, the performance, the prediction performance can be improved by two things. One is increasing the amount of data and introducing deep learning into this thing. And uh, we have Shilpa over here who's going to take over from here and going to talk about deep learning. And the person who is considered as the godfather of deep learning is Jeffrey Hinton. And again, all these people, Jeffrey Hinton and uh, uh, Fefele, they, I mean, you know, they, you will see them here in Silicon Valley sometime. You know, I mean, I've been to many of the Google conferences. And yes, she was one of the main speakers uh, at uh, Google conference. I've been to a sta couple of conferences in Stanford University. She was also one of the speakers over there. You will see them right over here, right amongst us, you know. And these people kind of completely changed the uh, picture. And uh, now deep learning is the reason why a lot of applications, uh, you know, they are using deep learning and the tremendous, you know, you have, uh, again, you, you're going to go through some examples of deep learning and things like that. Now, so I leave it to you. But I think before I introduce Shilpa, we have some, uh, this thing, right? I, Jim, would you yeah, like to come here? A, um, a raffle okay. right now. Okay. And so uh, if, uh, there, here we go. We have Gregory coming up here, and um, I think it's going to be two things, right? Two things, yeah. So yeah. the uh, first one, I'll go with Starbucks. Okay. So. All right. All nice and mixed together. in there. Yeah. Uh, Janet. Janet Woodthrop. Janet Woodthrop. All right. Yeah. Yay. Starbucks. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, are there any Wasp Bayesian folks in here? We have a small meetup next door, so if you're looking for that meetup, just okay. hop over there. Thanks. And Alex Mednick. Wow. There we go. All right. There you go. And now, uh, with, with no further ado, we're going to have uh, Shilpa Kohatkar. And before, yeah, jumping on that, so we still, are, if you didn't win this time, you still have another raffle afterwards, so feel free to stick around on that. Afterwards. Perfect. Okay. Uh, let me introduce Shilpa and you can... Uh... So today our speaker is Shilpa Kolhatkar. She is from NVIDIA. She is, uh, she's done her MBA from San Jose State University, and uh, she's a business development manager at uh, NVIDIA. And uh, she was with Cisco for almost uh, 15, 16 years before that, and she has been in the field of uh, IoT and... Uh, uh, AI and machine learning, yeah? And she's also the chair for WISE, Women in Science and Engineering. So, Shilpa, welcome, and uh, looking forward to your lecture. Awesome. That was a great uh, history of AI, and so we heard about the history. So now I'm gonna teach you the chemistry and biology of <laughs> deep learning. Um, so I'm a business development manager at NVIDIA, and I lead uh, all of the NVIDIA's um, deep learning-based solutions, specifically around video analytics. Um, and so I thought, uh, let me start off with, uh, you know, some of a good story, actually, which, which I really love. Um, how many car racing enthusiasts do we have here? Okay, so... If you've been keeping up with uh, you know, some of the, uh, the recent race which happened, the Formula One race car, um, the winning team um, chief, crew chief, was uh, asked at the end of the conference that, hey, congratulations, chief, your team won. But could you tell us why in the world did you call that last final pit stop in the last lap as it was getting really close to the end? You, one would never think of doing that, but you still won, but why did you do that? And his response was, it wasn't me. 
I did not call that pit stop. So everybody was like just stunned. And so it turns out that all of the, that car was equipped with a lot of sensors, a lot of cameras, and a lot of information was being gathered from that car, being collected and being passed to a data center. And a data scientist was actually sitting there looking at all the analytics. And it was the machine which was doing some sort of a predictive analytics which interpreted that, which kind of did a predictive analysis of, hey, it was time to kind of call a pit stop and do some maintenance. So those are the kinds of stories that you hear these days about um, machine learning and deep learning and AI solving some of these problems. Um, most of you live around here. Is it just me or has everybody started noticing at least one car every day, autonomous car with a lot of the cameras and everything and sensors? It's just phenomenal. In the last month or so, every single day, maybe it's because I, I'm right here at NVIDIA and on St. Thomas, we have our own cars as well. But it's, it's just amazing the pace at which things are, are changing. And uh, Golden State Warriors here, anybody? Right? So you know what they're doing, right? So the manager is very tech savvy and uh, the um, analytics from the player's game is being looked at and analyzed. Um, every single move, every single throw in order to uh, look at what are the best combinations of players that will give the best result. What are some of the, um, you know, sequence of moves which lead to the best outcomes. So a lot of such um, stories. I was uh, in Yellowstone this past June. And um, if, for those who have been there, definitely plan to visit. It's a phenomenal national park with these things called geysers, which erupt every so often. And the Old Faithful geyser is one of those which is just magnificent, tall display of um, you know, spurting water and stuff. And uh, so I was just curious, so, you know, we missed the first, so it had just finished its eruption. And there was a board over there which had its next eruption written down. And I was curious, like, how do they predict? Is it really that predictable? And it turns out that it's not predictable. There's actually somebody who is monitoring that um, over the years, over the hundreds of years. They have a lot of data on its patterns. And there are cameras and sensors in that area which are actually l collecting the temperature and timing and depth and the height of water and whatnot. And based on those camera images and sensor images, there's somebody in New York who's looking at that and then predicting, hey, the next eruption is going to be after 95 minutes. So you're going to start seeing a lot of these things, right? And uh, here's another set of examples where speech recognition, NLP, um, my kids are talking to Alexa or Google Home at home all the time. So I'm spared of some of those questions. I just say, hey, ask that to Google. And so they ask that, who invented such and such and such and such. Um, Cancer detection, diabetic in the healthcare, in the medical field, lots of different use cases, and AI is uh, coming to the rescue. And we has mentioned uh, the AI winter, um, which was very real, and that was, as he mentioned, primary reason was there's just not enough computational power available at that time. But now we do have a very heavy uh, compute available, supercomputers with as much as uh, 21 billion transistors. One of our servers that we make handles 21, has 21 million transistors. And the compute that it can do, the AI performance that it can deliver is equivalent to every single human being on this planet doing one calculation every second for 15 years. That is the amount of compute it can deliver. That's the performance that it can deliver. So it's just, that's basically um, uh, three exa, um, uh, exa fl flops of operation. Exa is 10 raised to 18, right? So uh, yeah, those are some of the use cases here. And uh, let's start with some of the definitions. So clearly we heard some of the, um, you know, what is artificial intelligence? Uh, uh, defined as. So uh, the way I like to think about it is automation. It's about automating um, any mental task. 
right? It's about automating um, human mental tasks. Um, and uh, machine learning is uh, typically, it's the set of tools and algorithms which makes that automation possible. And so we are teaching machines, we are programming machines to kind of carry out some of those functions. But do you think that it's possible to write if-then-else statements for every single combination in the universe? It's just not humanly possible. It's, it, you cannot scale it. You just cannot hard code everything um, in an if-then-else statement. And that's what traditional machine learning algorithms started out with. Right? It's about every combination, writing it down, and creating a hard-coded um, program for that. So deep learning is a subset of machine learning which took out that complexity of having to hard code some of those um, combinations. And deep learning is that set of algorithms which learns, where the machine automatically learns based on data. Okay, and we'll get into the details of what exactly those algorithms are, how they work, what are some of the common ones. Um, you heard about uh, computer vision. Um, you heard about computer vision beating human vision. That's true. So we don't have that competition anymore, the imaginal competition, because its accuracy is now higher than the human accuracy. So who's going to judge it, right? Um, you heard in the history, you know, this uh, has been around the development of algorithms um, and the math. That's been around for a long time. In fact, when I was in college, um, AI was my elective, and I had learned Lisp. So that was long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. And yeah, I'm old. Just, uh, and uh, we then um, are also starting to see a lot of uh, data that's been generated because pretty much every company is digitizing, and digitization produces data. So every single operation within your own companies, uh, be it HR, be it supply chain, be it manufacturing, be it any kind of operations, are being digital, digitized. And so there's lots of data that's been collected. And yet, um, the title of this says data deluge to data hungry, because we are really now at that point where AI needs and deep learning needs a lot of data. So these applications to train these models, they really need a lot of data. So we are in that state again where we are data hungry. And the winner in this AI space is really going to be the companies who have access to a lot of data. Right? So speaking of data, um, you've heard of the terms, uh, there's structured data and there's unstructured data. So structured data is those where um, you know, it's your, your spreadsheets which have perfectly labeled information in this case. Um, and I, I have to give uh, references, um, that credits to Andrew Ng's Coursera course, which has a lot of great uh, machine learning and deep learning um, coursework um, and OCD development. So I've taken some of these examples directly from there. And so this particular table is a set of structured data from um, um, predict for predicting uh, the cost of a house in a certain area. So you have information like the size of the house, the number of bedrooms, what zip code it is in, and that's called structured data. The other set of data is where it's not really structured, it's unstructured, and humans are very, very good at understanding and taking cues from unstructured data. Images, looking at videos, um, listening to music, listening to things. All of that is unstructured data. So that is the realm of, um, um, of data, which is really the fuel for deep learning. And I just want to um, give a little bit of understanding to you on what does a deep learning platform consist of. So in AI, there is, of course, the data piece, which you have to work off of a lot of data, which you have to clean up and manage and train. And I believe there have been some previous sessions on data. And so that is the data preparation piece. But once you, you've done that, the two key pieces are training and inference or deployment. So you train a system, you train a model um, to do a certain behavior, 
that's called your um, trained model. And once that model is trained on lots and lots of data, you then deploy or you put it somewhere to make an inference. Okay? So there's training and inference, and that's what you're seeing here. And there's a lot of frameworks um, and data sets which are readily available. And you must have heard of some of those names, but in this rest, next hour, I will cover some of them so you have a better understanding of what are some of these well-known frameworks, well-known networks, and well-known data frames. Um, so I'm sure a question must be popping up in your head, okay, can you really define the difference? What is different between machine learning and deep learning? And you know, how, how do you pinpoint that? So really machine learning is the traditional approach where you need domain experts, you need those um, data scientists, the programmers, to go in and hard code the combinations of features and it's called uh, uh, feature designing. And that those features have to be hard-coded. In this example, it's showing a car. And a machine learning algorithm would have to be programmed very detail-oriented in terms of identifying the number of doors, what's the shape of the headlight, um, the, the wheels, and whatnot. And in a deep learning, on the other hand, what's different is a programmer does not have to hard-code any of those features the machine automatically picks up the most interesting permutations and combinations of features that eventually leads to the right answer. And that's why I say that data is the fuel. Data is like the experience, just like a baby learns, right? A baby is shown different pictures of a lot of uh, cat pictures, for example, and then you, you basically we as a parent are going to label that picture and say cat. And then it uses that data and then is able to learn over a course of time. So it's, uh, it's about you know, removing that programmer one step away um, from the actual coding. And that's what makes it interesting. That's what makes it AI. Because if you're coding every single if, then, else statement, it's not much of AI, is it? So that's what the beauty of deep learning is, is that it really abstracts all of that information and the programmer is further removed. Um, uh, from that step. Um, we already talked about this, which is the more data you feed in into a deep learning system, the more accurate it gets, as opposed to a machine learning where it's hard-coded, it ju just doesn't self-learn beyond a certain time because somebody has programmed those formulas in. The minute uh, something changes, some parameter changes, then you're back to the drawing board and you have to redesign the system versus in a deep learning, it's gonna self-learn and it's gonna keep improving, right? So, uh, I like this one. So, um, the, you'll, you'll hear terms like, and I'll get into it, um, deep learning is made up of um, neural networks, and a neural network is a network of neurons. And what is a neuron is actually, it's something that's inspired by our own brain, uh, we, in our brain we have neurons, and these neurons are connected to each other, it's, they're stringed with each other. There's about 10 billion neurons that each one of us has or when a baby is born. And uh, through the years, one to six years old, um, they are building network connections between those neurons at the rate of 1,000 synapses. It's called synapses, the connections are called synapses. They're building that out at the rate of 1,000 synapses per second. And eventually it grows to about trillion, 100 trillion synapses within the whole brain. So that is what caused, the, that was the, the uh, neuron was inspired by the biological neuron. And, uh, there is a lot of controversy around whether the artificial neural network is really mimicking the human brain um, because of things like sentient and things like that. But you know that argument is losing that. That the point of um, inspired by new, by biological is that it tends to do the same function. So, for instance. Um, Aeroplanes are inspired by birds, right? But we didn't have to build like flapping wings on an aeroplane for it to fly. We used the same kind of design with wings, static wings, and then we used principles of 
aerodynamics and things like that to make it propel and lift and, and drive. So the point is that it's inspired by um, human biological neuron. Okay. Um, another point I wanted to mention here is that in a neural network, just like in your brain, uh, there are a certain set string of neurons which lights up when you're doing a certain task. If it is uh, speech related, there's a different part in the brain that lights up. If it's vision related, it, there's a different part in the cortex which lines, lights up. And that's what a neural net network does as well, is that it's uh, basically every neuron has a s it lights up based on the input received, okay? And I'll get into the details of that. But so here is where um, I'll start going a little bit into the details, starting out with a very basic structure of a neural network. And this is the example of um, trying to construct a model to predict the price of a house, okay? Now, in this example, um, it's assumed that size, number of bedrooms, the zip code, and the wealth around that area is going to predict the house price. And um, the Excel spreadsheet consists of rows and rows and rows of this information, size, bedrooms. Um, the columns are size, bedrooms, zip code, wealth, and the, there's one last column, which is the price. So that spreadsheet is going to be fed in, and it's going to eventually come up with some combinations that hey, size in bedrooms gives me, OK, it's going to be able to accommodate a certain family size. Zip code and wealth is going to kind of dictate the school quality. And so based on those family size and school quality, the price is going to be such and such. Right? So this is a human, this is a machine learning algorithm going to go and hard code all of these combinations. Because a human thought that after looking at the spreadsheet, any data, data scientists here? Anybody who's played around a lot with data and things? You, you all know the complexity of trying to fit a formula that fits a data set. It's not easy. So this is a example where a machine went in and determined that these are the important parameters. But there are challenges when, you know, as I said, if something changes, immediately the data scientist or the programmer has to go back to the drawing board and add yet another uh, combination here because, you know, guess what, the new data didn't match up with his formula. So in case of a deep neural network, what happens is you feed in all of this spreadsheet, which has your rows and rows and rows of size, bedrooms, zip code, and wealth, and the final outcome, the price. You're feeding this in, but you're letting the machine itself figure out, based on all that data, what are the interesting combinations? Is it bedrooms and size, or is it bedrooms and zip code? And it's, you're letting it figure out what these uh, things are, what these nodes are, OK? And that is what, uh, why these layers are called as hidden layers. So you'll start hearing these terms in neural networks. You're going to hear about neurons, which are these nodes, which are basically the features, the features of the data, OK? And you're going to hear about an input layer, which is all of your data set, which has the, um, uh, the, the problem that we are trying to solve here is the price of a house. So all the input layer consists of nodes, which are size, bedrooms, zip code, and wealth. And the hidden layers, we don't know what the computer figured out. We don't know. And that's why it's called a hidden layer. And that's why sometimes you'll uh, hear about the, what do you call that, the uh, interpretability of a, of a deep learning algorithm. It's not possible to pinpoint why it did something a certain way, because we don't know how it has figured out these combinations. You're not going to be able to ask a specific person that, hey, you done it? We don't know. Okay. Um, and that results in, so you'll also hear of things like weight and bias, and I'll get into that. So each of these uh, interesting features 
combinations are assigned neurons are assigned a certain weight and a certain bias to which then dictates whether that neuron should light up when a certain input comes in. And here this is a very simple, just one hidden layer, uh, but in a typical neural network, you would have many more additional hidden layers which would be lit up based on its previous input nodes, all right? Now, to make this more realistic with uh, image, um, you know, do, using, the, the previous example was very simplistic. It was about uh, Excel spreadsheet um, with uh, all of that house information and the price of the house, which probably is possible to do with a linear regression, with like a regular, you can find a linear regression algorithm that fits that data. And so you really don't have to invest a lot of resources on developing the deep learning model and all that. Because remember, I'll come to it in a little bit, deep learning model is expensive. It takes a lot of compute resources. Remember the 21 billion transistors I mentioned? Those things are expensive. And in order to do a neural network, it takes a lot of compute, and so not every problem really requires you to um, come up with a deep learning model. But something like a image classification or a speech recognition, um, definitely you would require a deep neural network to solve that kind of a problem. And now here, I'll introduce some additional uh, concepts to you. So we saw um, you know, input layers, hidden layers, and output layers. Now, in a learning, um, uh, in a deep neural network, what happens is the first step is you collect a lot of data. As I mentioned, data is the fuel. So in this case, it's feeding a lot of images to that model. And there are a lot of well-known models that you can pick up from. Um, we has mentioned one of the image net, net winners, Alex, Feifei, and there's a third, but I think it was Hinton. They won that competition and the, that network is called AlexNet. So for images, you can actually pick up one of the well-known networks. And you feed it a lot of data, but you have to train it for your own specialized problem that you want to do. Here we are trying to figure out whether this image is of a cat or a dog or a tree. And so when you pass all of that data through all the neurons, that step is called, it's, it's a forward propagation, but basically you're doing an inference, you're predicting what the outcome will be. You feed it a dog picture, and then the network predicts that hey, um, it is something with a certain confidence value. Okay, that number will be between zero and one. It'll come up with 0.70% confident that this is a dog. But 70% is not good enough. I mean, imagine, self-driving car with 70% vision. You don't want that. <laughs> so you have to go through a lot of iterations to train that model to do a perfect job. And that is called, so in the second step, what we do is adjusting that error or basically um, calculating how much far off you are, how off you are from the right value and fixing that, and that step is called the backward propagation. Okay, so these are some of the keywords here uh, that you'll encounter. So in backward propagation, you're going back and going back and adjusting the weights of every single neuron that, hey, um, no, you should not have lit up. Um, this is not, this is more like a cat picture, it's not a dog picture. So you kind of adjust the chisel, the way, weights down on each of the neurons, and that is the learning step, okay? Um, so, uh, so infer, calculate the loss, and then adjust the weights. So those are the three main things that those happen during the forward propagation and backward propagation. And some of the other step things that you'll uh, see in the math of all of this is something called a gradient descent, which means that when you're adjusting the weights of all of those nodes, um, you're gonna do it gradually, and that's called the gradient descent. It's basically, it's about like similar to when you've climbed up on top of a hill, and your objective is to go all the way down. Are you gonna jump down? Probably not. You're gonna go down, find the best way to go down, right, step by step. 
a little bit at a time. And that is what this network does, is it adjusts the weights little by little, and that is called gradient descent. Yes. It is programmatical. So the only thing that is manual is you select the type of, I'll get to it in a little bit, but you select the type of network, you select something called uh, the activation function. It's either a rectified linear unit or a sigmoid, and the number of epochs, the number of iterations that you're going to do. There are a few methods by which, so um, as I get to it, I'll get to your question. Okay. Um, now, here I'm showing, so this, what I showed you before for image classification, the name of the neural network um, is uh, called a convolutional neural network. Okay? So in deep learning, there are a few uh, algorithms for a certain type of tasks. Convolutional neural network is the network that's used for images, for uh, classifying uh, vi videos and images. Uh, recurrent neural network, RNN, is the one that's used for um, speech, okay? Deep Q networks, there's another set of networks um, that's uh, used for, you know, um, uh, in robotics or in gaming theory, you'll find a lot of those. Now, every picture is actually what? What is a picture to a machine? It's just pixels. It's just pixels. And so each image is basically, um, um, when I talk to you about the uh, square footage of a house and basically predicting the house price, it was very easy to conceptualize that, right? Because it was all like in a row of um, features that you fed into the machine. Even here, an image is basically translated into a bunch of pixels. So. If um, five by five image is a set of 25 pixels, and there's three different channels, the red, green, and blue, and so each for each color, you multiply it by three. So there's basically a set of 75 pixels that every image is translated into and fed, and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of these records are fed into the machine in order to train that machine. And it's really a value between each pixel is a value between zero and one. Um, it's the grayscale value, and that's how a machine looks at it. And um, uh, as it goes through um, this uh, training set, remember what I mentioned to you was finding the interesting features is a job that the deep learning neural network does on its own. A human does not go and program that, hey, look for an eye, and an eye is defined with a shadow like this, and a edge, sharp edge like this, and a curve like that, no. The machine automatically extracts all of the interesting, the, the features that it thinks defines the eye, and it, it makes that up. And then, so it's really a lot about breaking down that picture into small chunks, and then putting them together into what makes sense. So I'll just uh, kind of simplify it for you a little bit. Let's say I go into a factory um, that uh, looks for faces. And I give it, uh, this is a factory, and all, all its job is to look at, face, look at a face and come back with um, uh, you know, whether this is a face or not, face or non-face. And so this company is um, run by a set of um, people. And uh, there is one head hunch, like the main CEO, and he has many supervisors reporting to him. And each supervisor's role is a specific task. You know, one of the guys is responsible for looking for an eye. The other supervisor is responsible for looking at the right eye. And there's another supervisor responsible for looking at a nose. And there's another one for ears and So there's six neurons, six supervisors, who are going to be looking for extracting from that image an eye, a nose, a mouth, etc. And so when I pass this picture into this company, its uh, neurons are going to light up based on you know, the, the combinations that it thinks that it's an eye or a nose, and so on and so forth, until it reaches the head hunch, and the head hunch says, hey, eye supervisor, raise your hand, light up, and nose supervisor, light up, uh, left ear supervisor, raise your hand, light up, 
And right ear, super, right ear supervisor, raise your hand, but it doesn't raise its hand. But the head hunch says, mm, it's okay, I got two eyes, I got a nose, I got a mouth, I got only one ear, but I'm gonna call it an image. I'm gonna call it a face. And so it sends back that information. But you know, at that point, when it does a match with the, uh, remember we are working with uh, labeled data. Sorry, I didn't mention to you earlier. This, what we are talking about, is called supervised learning. Supervised learning means all your data sets are labeled data sets. Means when you passed a dog picture, it had the label of dog. When you pass a cat picture, it has a picture of cat, so that when the inference is made by the machine, it can compare with the ground truth. It can compare with the ground truth and calculate the error and calculate how far off it was from, its, from the ground truth. Remember, infer, calculate the loss, and then uh, correct the error or learn. So it, when it compares with the ground truth, it says, mm, I'm 70% confident, 70 is not good enough. So you do one more iteration, and you do a lot of iterations of these adjusting the weight, still you are like 99, 100% accurate that yes, this is a face. And that is what is happening with, uh, within a convolutional neural net. And so if you wanna um, get a little more detail into convolutional neural network, um, let's look at this example here. Um, it is about, um, you know, finding a um, particular image within a whole big image. Now in this case, it's find Waldo, find this guy with the striped shirt and uh, beanie um, in this whole entire picture. See how many places you see Waldo, right? So this problem can be solved with a convolutional neural network in terms of um, defining what you're looking for is that object identifier, it's called a filter. So these are some of the keywords here, which I've highlighted. So filter is you're gonna have a five by five cutout of Waldo, and you're gonna pass that all the way from left to right across that um, picture. And wherever there's a match, you know, though, that it's gonna light up. So think about it as um, um, when you go into a doctor's office for an eye exam, the doctor keeps a lens in front of your eye and then he has a board in front of you and saying, okay, can you identify that what's written on the board? And so he puts one lens and you're like, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure. I'm like about 70% confident that it is a A. Then he puts one more lens on top of it, keeps the first lens on, puts one more lens, and then you say, uh, yeah, it's looking a little better, maybe with 80% confidence, I think it's an A. And then he puts one more lens on it and boom, that letter just pops out at you, right? And so that, those combinations of lenses made that word pop out for you. That is what is called a combination of features, okay? So the, the, in a convolutional neural network, when I explained how uh, it breaks down that image into eyes, nose, mouth, each of those are features, and a combination of those features put together makes the whole uh, neural network. And so each feature is, each feature map, each feature creates a new set of images, and those are nothing but the hidden layers. That's the depth of the network, okay? So that is the depth, how many layers you're gonna have in the neural, convolutional neural network is basically how many feature maps you have. How many lenses is it gonna take to make that picture pop out nice and bright? So, Clearly, you can imagine that, you know, this is images we are talking about with a huge amounts of data. Um, and so there are some uh, mechanisms uh, that are implemented in order to start boiling down that picture. When you're doing this uh, image recognition, you have to employ some techniques um, to boil down that picture to its essence. In this case, we are trying to boil down the picture to just Waldos. We have 10 Waldos in this, and you want to just boil that down. So what we do that using something called a window and a stride. So this is a very um, con CNN um, technique. Uh, it's basically window is the size of your Waldo, okay? And stride is by how much you're gonna move that 
um, five by five Waldo pixel across left to right every time at every step. If you just move it by one pixel every time, you're really not gonna make much progress. You're gonna have a very huge convolutional network and it's just gonna run forever and ever and ever. If you move the five by five um, filter over by five, you will train much faster, but you might miss a uh, Waldo which is kind of straddling between the two five by five windows. He might be cut out between the two, so you're not gonna detect him. So there's a nice um, uh, rule of thumb, like you can have a window of five and a stride of two um, to kind of get the best um, uh, optimal result of how quickly you train a network, okay? There's also some uh, me methods called max pooling is another method that's used in CNNs. Um, and what that is is basically is just doing a reduction of the uh, image by downsampling the image. So it's like, you know, just you lose a lot of uh, resolution as a result. So that's not really a machine learning technique, like a window and stride, but that's just a brute force uh, mechanism to reduce the image size, okay? So when you squint your eyes, you'll still be able to see that, you know, that is the picture, but it has lost a lot of its uh, um, clarity. Um, so let's uh, look at some of the, um, how this actually is developed. So as I mentioned, um, deep learning application development, the first thing you are gonna need is a training data set. Very important to have the right data sets. Let's say we are trying to train a neural network to identify cats and dogs. Any, any cat and dog. You're gonna need a data set which is trained on a lot of cat images, dog images, in a lot of different environments, like in rain and snow and bright sunlight and different poses and whatnot. So you need a good mix of a lot of different images. That's what is important to have a good training set. Otherwise, you're gonna have, a, are there any data statisticians in here? Garbage in, garbage out. Very true for AI models as well. You need good um, data sets, clean data sets. And you can use some of the common data sets which are openly available over there. Um, ImageNet is one of them. Um, Street View, Google Street View is another one. Uh, house Numbers. Now I know um, uh, there's, uh, there's another one, MNIST, which is handwritten digits, uh, one to, so zero to nine. And in fact, this was developed very, very long ago. And the driver for that was um, the uh, US Postal Service. Uh, was trying to automate some of the reading of those addresses which we all write in our lovely handwritings, or used to. When is the last time anybody wrote a letter to anybody? Uh, when is the last time anybody like took a pen and wrote something? <laughs> Um, so in order to detect those zero to nine, um, there's lots of images of you know, different handwritings and different, in different colors, different lights, and that database is called the MNIST. And uh, that neural network um, is basically in the output, as you can imagine, the number of nodes that that network will have is how many. How many nodes do you think the neural network to detect zero to nine is gonna have? 10, 10 output, it's gonna be a number. It's gonna predict, yes, this is a zero, yes, this is a one. So the number of outputs uh, of the neural network is basically the number of uh, number of nodes is number of outputs that you're trying to classify. Um, there's also some um, well-known data sets for uh, sentences, um, songs, uh, the million song data set is for songs. And um, so once you've done that, you're then gonna pick an untra a neural network. And again, there's a lot of well-known neural networks. Um, and so typically you would just pick one of the well-known neural networks and we have um, ResNet50 by Microsoft, VGG by Oxford, Inception Network by Google. There's AlexNet, which was mentioned earlier. Um, and AlexNet, um, yeah, the, uh, that detects um, thousand different classes. So it's, it's got a very big uh, capability of detecting different types of uh, objects yeah, across thousand different classes. Um, speech and audio networks, Baidu has developed something called deep speech, Google has WaveNet, um, and machine translation, uh, Facebook has uh, FairSec, and there's the Google network machine language, machine translation. 
Um, now, all of these uh, networks, why do you think they're all openly available? Because as we are all starting to see, AI is pretty new. It's not very mature yet. And the more you share, the more you care. The more you care, the more you share. So you, you do want adoption, right? You want adoption. And so a lot of companies are making these uh, data sets and the neural networks that they develop available. So on GitHub, you'll find these resources. Now, once you have uh, selected a data set and a neural network model, then you're going to start the training process. You're going to train that neural network specific to your data in order to do what you want to do. So in this case, we are trying to train the network to detect dog or cat. And so you're going to feed that data set of dogs and cats hundreds and thousands of images over and over and over into this network till all the nodes have the right, um, they, the right node gets lit up with the right weight to detect a certain, um, the, the picture of a dog or a cat. And um, the, uh, I mentioned networks, but there's another term that you're gonna come across is framework. So what is this framework business? What is, what is framework? Framework is nothing but the graph, mathematical graph, which translates your Python language into a language which the hardware, the silicon can run, okay? And so, the, so there are some of the common frameworks, deep learning frameworks, they speak the machine learning language. They take in Python, Python developers here, right? So it's, it's straightforward and easy to code in Python, pass it through the common framework, and out, outputs a C code, which runs on the hardware. So um, TensorFlow is one of the frameworks, very popular uh, by Google. Uh, PyTorch, um, very popular with uh, researchers, um, and uh, Cafe2, MXNet by Amazon, um, CNTK by Microsoft. These are some of the common frameworks. And um, we talked about, uh, in the training phase, we talked about the phrases um, finding out, the, in the infer, find out the loss function or the cost function, and then do a back propagation to adjust the weights with a gradient descent. And then you also have something called the activation question, uh, function. So initially there was a question around, um, does a human do this? So all of this, um, um, the, the network, the mathematical model is, is actually in this neural network. And some of the, um, there are also some um, tools, um, some very GUI-based tools which are available to users to go and pick up some of these networks and train it for your own specific data, for your own specific problem. And there what you'll see is you're given the flexibility to pick what kind of an algorithm activation function you want to run on it. So rectified linear unit is one of them, sigmoid is one of them. So these are nothing but like a non-linear part of the function. So there was the linear equation, which kind of in the house's example, it was a certain combination of bedrooms and size. That was a linear part of the function. But in order to get the final output, um, you know, maybe there are some, when you're doing the back propagation, um, you wanna, you know, adjust the weights and you want to apply an activation function which is even out all of the negative values make it zero because I want my network not to you know, train a certain way. So there are some of these um, mathematical equations, ReLU, Sigmoid, and SoftMax, which are the most common ones that are applied. And um, epoch is the term used for how many iterations of the entire data set goes through the neural network once. So if you have 10 epochs, that means you trained your um, neural network by passing that source data 10 times through the network. And um, as you do those epochs, you start seeing that the inference, uh, the confidence vector, the percentage with which it says, yes, this is a face, or yes, this is the number nine, it starts improving. If you see, that you know, it's only returning with 0.7% or 70% confidence that this is the number nine. You want to run the data set, the whole number MNIST database, a few more times. And then it'll automatically start giving a better 
and better and better confidence that a certain number is the right number. Okay. Um, so once you have a model, trained your model with this new capability of detecting whether it is a dog or a cat, then you can actually optimize it to depending on where you're ready to deploy it. Because as you can imagine, sometimes inference is required right on your mobile phone, sometimes it's required in the cloud, sometimes it's required. So it's really dependent on where you're going to carry out the inference. Sometimes it's inference is going to be carried out right on the camera, right? Like I uh, if you have video at home, I have video cameras at home, and then when my kid walks in, I want to be able to detect that it's my kid's face and give, send me an alert that, yes, your kid has reached home. So all of that um, model has to fit right there on the camera, and these models can be heavy. So you want to try to optimize the models based on whether it's going on a phone, a camera, or it's somewhere in the data center where there's enough compute. So there are some optimization um, techniques that are used. And some of them are dropout. So what dropout, you'll hear this phrase, is a mechanism um, to prevent overfitting. Overfitting is another term, which means that if you have a lot of data, sometimes the model is going to try to fit every single point on that data graph. And it's the line is going to go all over. It's going to not be a straight linear line. It's going to try to fit all the outliers. And you, sometimes you don't want to do that. So to prevent that, um, you're going to employ a technique called um, dropout. Fusing layers is another mechanism, which is basically if you have too many uh, feature um, levels, feature layers, you want to fuse some of them because you don't want, you don't see the value of, um, it's not making too much difference to your output. The output still continues to give you 90, 95% accuracy, and it just changes to 95.2% accuracy by removing one layer. So that's fusing layers to reduce memory because you're on a iPhone which doesn't have much memory or a camera which doesn't have enough memory. Or pruning layers where you're going to remove some of the um, nodes which don't contribute to the outcome. So when nodes don't contribute, which has a very low um, weight, you just start pruning those nodes and you reduce the size of the model. Okay, So those are some of the optimization techniques. I'm sorry this was a lot of math, but this is Convolutional neural networks, uh, deep learning, does have a lot of math, but the good news is that there are a lot of tools available. I already mentioned some of the freely available data sets, freely available frameworks, and some of the um, tools that are available even for training your data sets. So you don't have to be really familiar with the math. Um, and um, in terms of the workflows, deep learning workflows, um, as I mentioned, not every problem should be solved by deep learning um, because it's just way too expensive. All that math that I talked about, it's a lot of, basically, what is it? It is just a set of multiply and multiplication and addition. It's matrix multiplication, okay? So it's a lot of uh, these um, calculations which are going to be happening in parallel, um, but so it's very suitable for images and objects. And so in this first picture, what you're seeing is find instances of all the vehicles that you see. And so drawing a bounding box around the image. And uh, classifying, once you've identified where in the picture a certain image is, that is object detection, you can classify what the picture is. So uh, detection is the term for where. You'll hear about these terms as well, object detection, object classification segmentation, and that's the difference between these. Classification is finding out what that object is once you figure out where it is. And then image segmentation is you sometimes cannot um, clearly, crisply put a bounding box around it. You, it's, it's like the, um, the range of spread of it, spread of a certain kind of, in this case, you know, spread of a certain kind of tumor in a cell. That is an image segmentation problem, okay? And so really, um, when it comes down to the business level of um, deep learning, what you want to ask is, is the task, um, what kind of a task is it? And that will help you determine whether you should use a deep learning detection 
uh, algorithm or deep learning classification algorithm. And the inputs com can be coming in in the form of text, speech, video, audio. But really, you're trying to f if you're trying to figure out whether something is present or not, whether a car is parked or not in this parking lot, that's a detection problem. Um, sorry. And um, that's really around, you know, use cases in healthcare are, for example, looking for a certain type of an image in a cell a picture, cancer detection. Um, what type of thing it is, is a classification problem. So looking at a certain, um, uh, once you've identified a picture, finding out what type of, uh, what characteristics it has is classification problem. And to what extent it is present is where I talked about, you know, it's basically finding how, how much it has spread. So in this case, in healthcare, it's about figuring out the size of the tumor, right? And um, this is a very common one, um, is what is the likely outcome? What is the prediction? Now, this one is about um, predicting the outcome. It's predictive analytics. You know, all of, mo many of us are uh, involved in a lot of projects involved around predictive analytics. And this is where you are trying to detect based on history of, um, uh, based on patterns. So, you know, sometimes you get a call from your credit card company that, hey, a uh, charge was made in such and such a city. Did you, um, did you initiate that? And it's able to do that because it detects an anomaly. It detects something which is outside of the regular pattern of your behavior, okay? And so th that is the prediction. And uh, recommendation. Recommendation engine is very, very um, common. It has a lot of economic value these days, right? Uh, you will also like to buy, or if you bought this, it'll show you some of the other people have also bought this, right? So, um, or shop the look. Um, so those are some of the uh, economy, uh, economy values uh, that businesses are looking for to derive from AI. All right. Yeah. So, as a consumer, um, we do use um, AI, though we may or may not realize in our everyday lives. Uh, uh, so, any time that you are uh, browsing around on Netflix to watch your movie, it shows you a list of um, movies which, based on your previous history and how, what you've been watching and things like that, it kind of recommends that movie to you. It's actually using some of these algorithms. It's using a lot of data that is collected. As uh, you know, I don't know how many Facebook users are here, but when somebody uploads a picture of you, a friend of yours uploads a picture of you, you get a notification that, um, hey, uh, your friend has uploaded a picture of, of you. Do you want to tag yourself, right? So that is another example of the Facebook algorithm automatically detecting your face and classifying it as you. So that's a detection and classification problem. And then asking you that, hey, this is your picture and it's been uploaded. So that's another consumer example. Um, shop the look. Um, I have found myself recently um, looking for, I saw one of my friends was wearing a watch which I really liked, and I forgot to ask her what it was, but I could describe, I knew how it looked like. So I just went on Google and I typed in um, silver and black strap, black dial, diamonds. And right enough, it actually came back with a watch image, which was exactly, that was a tag watch, and it was exactly that. It's very, I mean, all of these um, uh, examples of machine language translation to pictures and vice versa are all real, and we are all using them. Um, yeah, so some of you may have examples of, you know, how you are using deep learning and any of these machine learning in your daily lives. But uh, if you go down to San Francisco, there is actually a delivery robot for pizza delivery and marble robot that walks on the streets and it's actually doing the last mile delivery of uh, pizza. So robotics actually is the, I wouldn't say final frontier, but it's, it's the uh, end goal where you will start, you'll, 
you're giving a body to the AI. Right? You're giving a body to all of that thinking and deep learning. This body is going to start even actuating stuff. Right? Because what you're doing is um, basically AI is about thinking. So if we, I talked about thinking, about the deep learning, about figuring out things, making inference. Planning, you see a lot of planning in self-driving cars. It has to figure out its next move. It has to predict things which it has not seen around the corner. You and I as humans, through our experience, we know that a certain corner usually has kids coming out at a certain time, so we are going to slow down and we are not going to turn. A car has to be able to make those kinds of planning decisions uh, without even seeing things. So it cannot rely on just its sensors, like its LIDAR, radar, and vision sensors. It's going to rely on something else, the planning. And then uh, it has to act. So that's moving it, actuation. Right? So that is, the fine, that is the eventual goal of AI, um, is to be, is when I have a car to be able to drop and pick up my kids from all their classes and all their school and everything so that I'm freed of that task. That's gonna be success of AI for me, personally. Right? Uh, let's see what we have next. How are we doing on the time? Okay. All right, so. Any questions uh, so far? Okay. So, uh, uh, deep learning is really a form of neural network? Is that a modern neural network? Neural network is the terminology uh, used, uh, yes, and it is deep learning and neural network, you can say, is uh, analogous. So neural networks are the models that are used um, in deep learning. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to read the rest of the things for you. <laughs> I had a lot of uh, information to share, and I was very excited to share all this information with you. So I'm just making sure I didn't miss anything important, any important math formula, for example, that I'm going to quiz you on in a little bit to win the final raffle. They're going to quiz you on what I spoke about. Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> all right. So, recurrent neural networks. This is another type of a deep learning neural network. Feeling good, I am. This kind of a sentence only kind of resonates with you if it's Yoda talking, right? It's like a sequence of words which are a little gibberish, a little out of sequence. This is the uh, typical scenario for uh, like a recurrent neural network. The things that it has to take into consideration is the sequence in which the data is received. Okay, in your um, spam filters, which were invented 20 years ago when email was invented, 25 years ago, all they had to look was a bag of words for the word Nigerian prince or Viagra, right? You just had to look for a word, not followed by before, after. You didn't have to worry about that. And anybody seen a Nigerian prince email lately? It just goes directly into your spam filter. But in a recurrent neural network, it's important not just to look for the word Nigerian prince, but the sequence of what you said is very important. So for example, I'm going to want you to translate from English to Spanish. Um, hello, how are you? I'm going to want you, you're all my machines, deep learning networks, and I want you to translate, hello, hola, how, comma, are, are. A-R-E-R -R has two words it can come back with in Spanish. Son, right? But in this case, I don't want to say so. It's, it, it, that's not the right thing. 
Why? Because it's followed by, hello, how are you? How are you? How are you? So it has to come back with estas. Hola, como estas? Not with son. Because R has two words, and you have to come back with the right response based on what's after the word R. Right? So that's an example of a, a machine translation which is dependent on the sequence and the timestamp of the uh, problem that it's trying to solve. Got it? And for that reason, in a recurrent neural network, is different from a convolutional neural network because it has one additional element which is called the memory. It has to remember what came before it. And so for that, there are some neural networks designed. Um, to, the LSTM is, is one of the networks. It's long short-term memory. It has to keep a short-term memory of, hello, how are you? It has to remember, hello, how are And so that has some more math associated with it. It has input gate, output gate, forget gate. So it has to remember some things for a certain time till a full stop, and then maybe it can forget it, or maybe not. Sometimes you're talking sarcastically, right? So maybe it cannot forget everything. It has to remember what context it was spoken in, right? So those are some of the math, and that's why the algorithm for correcting and adjusting the weights here becomes backpropagation through time, okay? BPTT, so backpropagation, not the normal go and adjust the weights, you backpropagate through time. And there are some other challenges associated with, uh, as you backpropagate and correct errors, um, there are some uh, weights which become like really, really small. And so you, you really s discover that your neural network is not getting better at all. Its performance is just not improving. So you learn to omit certain weights. So those, those are some of the um, aspects of recurrent um, uh, neural networks here. And uh, um, there's combinations of convnet, convolutional neural network, CNN, and RNN, and LSTM, which can be used to do very creative things. I mentioned to you one of the things when I was looking for my watch or shop the look. Sometimes I want to see uh, how to combine a few things um, to, to like, you know, get, get a certain look. And you can do that today because um, there are uh, ways to take a text image and translate it into uh, you know, text to speech, text to translate it into um, image to text. So two young girls playing with Lego toys, right? So this is image to text translation, which is done with a combination of those two different types of networks, CNN and RNN. Um, so I believe, Yep, this is another example of um, image to text translation dog playing catch with a white ball. And you know, all of these are some of the um, real world examples of deep neural networks, which we use every day, in fact. So this is another example of how consumers are using this. And whatever consumers are using is being used by enterprises to, as data. And you'll be surprised how Facebook, um, it has something called a data selfie. So it's not your picture selfie, but there's a macro that you can download on your Chrome browser and enable it. And then what you'll see when you do that, you click on it, you'll be able to see how Facebook does an interpretation of your profile. What are your views? What are your opinions? It's going to predict uh, some of the things. Data selfie. Yeah, and I think they deprecated it. Uh, they, 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 now what it does, it, it doesn't do any new predictions, but you can go back and try. Mm -hmm. Those are the, uh, let me see, what was this number here? I believe that's the confidence levels, but I don't know why you have the negative and the pos more than one values here, but that's a good question. I'll have to come back to you on that one. Just picked up this on one of the speech to text, uh, image to text uh, lookups that I was doing. Um, so here are some of the common neural networks. As I said, no need for you to go and you know if you're looking to do freelancing on CNNs and NLP, um, 
you're not going to design these from scratch. You're going to pick up, for computer vision related problems, you're going to take a ResNet 50 or an Inception Google network or an AlexNet. Speech and video for voice recognition or for language translation, you're going to take uh, Baidu's uh, deep, deep speech or Wave 2, WaveNet's deep voice. Or for machine comprehension, speech to text and kinds of things, you're going to take one of these FairSec by Facebook or GNMT by Google, a lot of new common neural networks. Um, I talked about frameworks, so I talked about data sets, talked about fr uh, frameworks, this is the frameworks, common frameworks, TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Cafe2. So these are the graphs which translate your Python language into the C language so your machine can run all the math, okay, faster. So these are the frameworks which um, let you do that. Um, I did have a few um, problems here for you, so we can just do one of them here uh, to see your, and I wasn't kidding when I said I'm gonna quiz you, and your raffle is gonna depend on that, okay, kidding. But given a person's age, weight, habits, like smoking or non-smoking, family history, uh, your designer system um, which will ex ass assess the cost of that person, the, whether that's an expensive person um, from a health insurance standpoint or whether it's a not expensive, I don't want to say cheap person, non-expensive person from a health insurance standpoint. So what do you think? Will it be, a, how would you design this using machine learning? How would you design this using deep learning and which one is a better approach? It could be a deep learning problem. Actually, in this case, I believe, you know, for, for a health of a person, not everything is linear. When you're 16 years old, maybe you just have to visit to your, just for your annual checkup. But when you're 40, maybe you have to go every six months. When you're 90, you have to go, you know, maybe once every month. So age combines with itself, right? It's not linear. The combinations of age, and weight, you know, your BMI, um, whether you're a smoker or not, whether you're a smoker or not makes a difference based on your weight as well. So if you are a smoker and obese, then that makes it a more uh, different health risk versus if you're just a smoker. So sometimes these parameters combine very differently and it's not linear. So you can feed a spreadsheet rows and rows and rows and rows of the person's age, BMI, weight, smoking habit, and the, um, you have to go off of historical data. So you can collect a lot of data from hospitals on these information, on uh, insurance companies from this information, feed it into your system, and the neural network will figure out the right combinations of nodes, which will give it the best inference, best probability of uh, figuring out the cost of that person. Okay? Um, you have to create a system that can translate a message written in Japanese to Spanish so that the Spanish can address the local. So this is an NLP problem. What would you use to solve an NLP problem? We talked about RNNs, yeah, recurrent neural networks, remember? Hola, hello, how are you? Como estas? So that is an RNN. Uh, problem. It has associated with retention memory, long short-term memory, LSTM. Um, you have to build a software component for a self-driving car, and the system you should build uh, should take in raw pixel data, you know, grayscale images from cameras, and predict what would be the angle by which you can steer your car. So you're taking images in, you're figuring out something based on the images, you, could, you would use CNN and RNN because here you're doing the image, translate images as well as your, you have a sequence of events on, in the planning. You cannot just work off of images independently um, without a time sequence. All right, so um, were there any questions? Yes.
You know, I saw a cartoon, Dilbert cartoon clip not very far back. Um, it said, your job is not going to be replaced by a robot. Your job is going to be replaced by a person who speaks robot. So there's always going to be a human in the loop, um, according to me, in all the problems that we um, uh, saw. Uh, there, there's a human in the loop to kind of make uh, the final um, you know, decisions and things like that. So I don't believe that we are at that maturity le level yet. Um, and uh, I, I did have a f funny video which kind of would have emphasized that, but my NLP is not working, otherwise I would have spoken to this MacBook and said, play the video. It's about a, a guy who goes in, um, he's shown to be in his house and he's, it's home automation everywhere. And he says, make my coffee and bring me my toast and turn on the lights and turn on the music and whatnot. And he walks out and goes to the dentist and gets some dental work done. And then when he comes back, he says, open the door. But he says, oh, and the door just won't open. The door just won't open. And so he has to use his manual lock and key to do that. And then he says some other inappropriate things to his neighbor who is going there, and she gets pissed. So those are some of the challenges, I believe, which uh, we definitely are in the process of. Uh, and we are creating the future here. I think that's the most exciting part, is that we are creating the future. No, that's why that's called the hidden layer, and it is up to the neural network on how it does the best combinations and extracts the features, and that's why that's that whole issue around interpretability. How did this AI come up with this outcome? How do I reverse engineer it? Who done it? We don't have that. Yeah, but remember, I, in that example of uh, house prices and uh, uh, predicting the house price, the, uh, we mentioned that when you are going to let the machine determine the best combinations of the n node or the neuron, um, we, s we are letting the machine determine uh, what that combination is. So we don't know. Let me go back into slide mode here. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, I'm just going to go like this. Yeah, so when we uh, give it up to the machine to determine the permutation and combination which makes the most sense for it in terms of whether this is the most interesting feature which is going to lead to an outcome and to a confidence level of 0.99 that yes, this is what it is. We don't have a say on that. It's the, the network is assigning the weights by itself. It's making those combinations of different features by itself. It's just so happened that in a hard-coded machine language, traditional old algorithm, there would be a programmer who would combine two features to create a third feature but not in a, it's the neural network which figures out, that's that automation of feature extraction, which is what removes that programmer, remember, and that's what makes it AI. Yeah. These are all the, yeah, transistors. So basically, uh, when I talked about the frameworks, TensorFlow, those are the graphs, remember? They are laying it out in that machine understandable language. And there are a lot of, actually, you should hold another session just on the math and the languages. There are something called Julia and MATLAB. There's a lot of math um, algorithms and languages which are actually in work in the behind the scenes while it's preparing all that multiplication, matrix multiplication, so that the GPU, it's usually uh, the compute is GPUs, graphical processing units, and uh, those GPUs function on matrix multiplication, 
And there's a lot of math algorithms which are converting your Python languages into what kind of multiplication does it have to carry out. So Shilpa, thank you very much for getting us deep into deep learning. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And here on behalf of uh, Hacker Dojo, we would like to present you this uh, souvenir. Thank and you yes, this much. souvenir was entirely made at Hacker Dojo. Everything is from here. Very nice. Uh, the laser, laser cutting machine over here. Yeah. So it's, again, it's a maker space. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Hey, so, couple of things. I think we do have another raffle drawing. But before we do the raffle drawing, I do want to mention that next week we are having Vishnu Hari from Accenture coming over here and talking about chatbots and voice assistant. And he is very much unlike Shilpa in the sense that Shilpa, uh, she has kids and all. He's a single guy, and he has he came up with a chatbot. He is into like uh, he does. Uh, he I think he's a uh, he's on Tinder and on Tinder dating site. So he created a chatbot and that chatbot has been dating with his potential matches, and it has been tremendously successful for him. So he said he's going to narrate that story of how he came up with this chatbot and for that initial conversation with his potential dates, the chatbot takes the conversation up to a certain extent and then he comes into the picture. So he's managing it very efficiently uh, and uh, I think he's going to be here next time. I mean, you know, I, okay, so I think please do come over here for the uh, chatbot and virtual assistant thing and the virtual assistant, as you all know, is all Siri, Alexa and uh, uh, Bixby and uh, other things, yeah? So anyway, uh, where are we with the drawing? Okay. <laughs> okay, come on, okay. <clears throat> okay, I will hand it over to Jim, please. Okay, we have uh, two more uh, giveaways here. Um, let's see now, let's go for the... Must be present to win. Yeah, must be present to win. Uh, Starbucks first. All right. And... VS Joshi, yes! Um, I think this is Conti Gata. There we go. Oh yeah, all right. Starbucks right here. All right. So, is there anybody else that want to put their card in here Thank you. before I get them? Just take out the card. <laughs> take out your card. And this is uh, Prasanth, Prasanth HPE. Yeah, oh, there we go. And so, what? And so that's everything, folks. Thank you for coming out, and we'll see you.